Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming in a new Baldur's Gate video. We're back again for another round of weird and interesting or often super helpful things you didn't know. As always, a huge thank you to everyone in the comments of each video making suggestions for the series. Today we're going to be talking about, say, a useful permanent summon many people, including myself, miss, and other useful stuff. But with that said, let's just begin. So to begin with, we have one that Josh made me aware of. You can get Shovel as a familiar you can summon. And you can do that as a non-spellcaster if you'd like. This is via an area in the Blighted Village in Act 1 that many people missed, including myself, Josh, and Cotton, so surely we're not the only ones. This little summonable character, though, can be a permanent summon, which serves many purposes outside of just being a potential meat shield. Here's what you need to do, though. I've jumped back onto an Act 1 save to show you. We're in the Blighted Village in the center of the wilderness, and we're going to go onto the south side, as you can see by the sign here, a shop, an apothecary, which is obviously no longer in use. Now, if you come around, you'll find a secret area down below, a wooden hatch that you can go down. Down here is a lot of useful items to get very early into your playthrough, especially the potion of healing recipe to get you going on that. But on the north wall, if you have a perception check, it'll be revealed. There's actually a lever behind these crates. So let's just move those out of the way and pull the lever and see what's going on. As it turns out, there is a secret behind this bookshelf, and it's no wonder I missed this originally. If you follow this around, you'll come to an area with a little bit of grass, and more importantly, it has these kind of caskets laying around. And in one of these, there is the summon for our quasar. The problem, as you can see, is a one-time use, destroyed upon use of the scroll. But because of the specific one you're going to summon, you can actually make a companion. At this point, before you do anything though, I would recommend a hard save in case you mess anything up, and then you can try again. To do this summon, you will need someone with level one in a type of spellcasting. Specifically, it needs to be something like Gale is, such as a wizard, or it could be a sorcerer or warlock specifically. So if you want it on your own character and you're not one of those, you can temporarily respect to get one of those levels by going to withers in the camp and then respect back after you're done and keep the familiar personally i'm probably just going to use it on gale though since him having a summon especially early game can be quite useful so with the character you're going to give the summon to let's use it and spawn in shovel who is actually an achievement once you summon him with some delightful dialect you'll hear so you're going to have a conversation with shovel here and you're going to need to well successfully have the conversation to get through this conversation with success then you're going to take the first option six times and then the second option on the seventh choice and then finally the first option on the final eighth choice that's a bit confusing so what you can do is look at the dialogue options and always take the first option until you come to the line that says no you won't do deeds like that or essentially tell him he won't do what he just asked at which point you take the second option which is is that what you and your own master did here i guess you can see the journal will update and we'll progress with shovel he'll reference the book and you can ask him about that book and he'll tell you to go have a look specifically saying talk to the mirror. So as you come around from the entrance, head around to the southeast, and eventually you'll find the mirror that he's talking about. To pass through the mirror, you'll need to answer its questions. Start by telling it your name and then say you're an ally of the master, at which point you have to pass three questions. The first one you want to go against the individual they're asking about, saying he's like a foul lich. The next question is what to do with a certain ointment, so you want to say to clean a wound. And then finally, it'll ask you what you want, and then you basically say get rid of the worm in my head. With that, the mirror will open, and with the character that we want the summon to go to, we will walk through, finally. At which point we can speak with Shovel, who will call us a very nice spell-based name, and generally excited because you made it here, will join you. And as you can see, after that conversation, after that interaction, suddenly he's appeared on my hotbar. Always prepared and castable on any short rest, this ritual will last until your long rest. This allows you to summon Shovel wherever, whenever you want, who comes with invisibility, which is obviously very useful to getting places that you otherwise shouldn't or couldn't. And as a summon, he has Scare, which will allow you to frighten a creature. Frightened creatures have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls and can't move, which is a very potent thing indeed, especially in the early game in Act 1 like this. Also, as an extra bonus, there's a gilded chest in this room which has a pair of blue braces giving you a plus bonus to your ac if you're not wearing armor or holding a shield so good for a caster but that's the short story of shovel and how you can get yourself a permanent companion which can be very useful again as a meat shield or his abilities as early as act one that i completely missed 
moving on from this Act 1 stuff, how about one from the comments from Droid Rage Psycho, who explained an incredible tip to do with actually increasing your attitude with a vendor. It's something I've explained before, so extremely briefly, you can improve your attitude with vendors, and ultimately that means when you sell stuff to them, they give you more gold, or they'll sell their stuff to you for less. So that's a great thing to do on a vendor you plan to use and sell to many times in the future. To make them like you, you can literally just give them stuff. For example, I can be in the barter tab, I'm like, here's this legendary pair of gloves and you can just have them for free, my friend. The trader will be pleased with this offer. Yeah, I'm sure they will. So when I literally give him these legendary gloves, he's happy with that and his attitude increases by eight. However, apparently this increase is tied to your level because I'm currently, you know, max level. He's not really giving me nearly as much rep as he otherwise would if I were much lower level. So let's test this out. I'm back to Withers. I'm going to respec. And I'm going to go try that again at level one. So we're back to the vendor. I am currently level one. Let's Let's try that now that we've reloaded and give him the exact same pair of gloves, the gloves of soul catching for 400 gold in value. Now it's going to be 343 gold in value, which is interesting. It's changed the value of the item. Let's do the barter and see how much we get. Wow, that's insane. So I did not get eight attitude for that barter. I got 85. So with a single item barter trade or just gift, I have reached max attitude with this vendor. So yeah, everything that I trade with them now is going to be significantly cheaper. Or again, if I sell stuff to them, they'll give me more gold. Obviously, this is a crazy example. You should never give a legendary item like that away. That's a great tip, Droid Rage Psycho. Thank you. Here's a really quick tip from Killer Bite in the comments. This is a follow-up from an idea where I talked about how I didn't realize you could do something. So basically, you can right-click an item and go, okay, let's send this to Asterion. Let's say I just opened a chest, I found some arrows, I want to give that to Asterion who actually has a bow. So I can do it that way. Or I can do something just a bit simpler and less like, okay, wait for it to load and then pick the right person. I can just take the thing and drag it and it's now on Asterion. Really smooth process. But it was Killabyte that said, you know, in the same line of thought, you can do the same thing with storage. Take a backpack, a chest, anything really that's a container you can put stuff in. Of course, it'll have all these slots and I can be like, all right, let's put that there. Let's put that there and so on and so on. Good example of that would be the actual sorting chest that has all of this stuff in it and you know it can be a bit awkward to manually drag it into the specific slot that's empty without accidentally doing this 400 times and going oh whoops 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 you know it's kind of annoying so if you are looking to put things in containers of this nature like the storage chest and just do it quickly when you're doing individual items you can't just drag it to the icon at the top of whatever it is you're putting it in whether it's actually the icon of a chest inside your inventory or a bag like this it'll just go in or it'll just go straight into an empty slot where wherever there is one. This is of course a great tip if you're doing a quick saw or dumping like that. On that note, I want to highlight that people every video are commenting the old uh, control click highlight things and then you can right click center camp in one go or you could say shift click and do multiple items in one go like that. This is something I've talked about in the series before so I don't want to make it a thing again but I'm acknowledging it now. But one little caveat to that is how you can actually kind of drag all the items you've got in that gathering and move them around in chunks like that. Or I guess we could just like throw them on the ground all in one crazy loop if you wanted to specifically do that. There's so many interesting ways you can interact with inventory and make the process of doing that a bit smoother, which is pretty cool. Next up, we have a double tip from the comments. One from Pops91 and one from the Ninja Penguin. So thank you to you both. I've kind of combined your tips. So Ninja Penguin suggested that you can, without alerting everyone, use a cloud of obscuration or maybe your silence at the same time, though it wasn't necessary for me. Basically, I take a spellcaster like someone like Gale here, cast Fog Cloud, or I could use something like Darkness as an alternative. Basically, you obscure the area and someone within it who is obscured and potentially also silenced can be defeated within one turn and if they're silenced no one will hear their screams which is kind of morbid. This means you can just assassinate people without anyone actually seeing or knowing for sure that it was you. I mean these guards come over who are standing right there in the middle of the town while I just basically assassinate this guy and stole loot from him and they were like yeah no it wasn't you I definitely didn't see you do that it was just a mysterious cloud that you walked out of. So with this tip you can use your obscuring spells and abilities to assassinate people with very little consequence. 
But the other tip and aspect of this comes from Pops, who highlights the fact that if you go to your passives and toggle on the non-lethal attacks, you can knock people down and loot them without actually killing them. Therefore, a merchant like this with particularly valuable things, like a key, like this incredible chess piece, in fact, I could just take that with no consequences and not having to buy it at all. That's because I've obscured the area, I've taken him out in one turn, I've non-lethal knocked him out so I can just loot him, and then once I'm done, I can walk away, rest, come back, and everything's as normal, and he's selling as normal with no grudges and no problems. Kinda nuts. So whether you're assassinating people or whether you're just robbing them, these two tips mesh well together, so I hope that's useful to you. It's definitely going to be useful to me. Our next tip comes from someone who's got a strange name on YouTube. I'm not sure if they even have a username. It just says user YZ8 so and so on, but I want to credit you, so I'll put it on screen. But it's to do with Gale or other spellcasters, I suppose, that have spell slots you want to restore in this tricky way. So let's take Gale here and let's cast some spells. So I'll cast Haste at level 3, so we've lost level 3 there. I'll cast a level 6 version, which is obviously a lot more expensive. Let's do a few teleportations, which I can do at level 2 at level three, at level five. So we can see that I'm missing the spell slots, basically. Right, let's restore these spell slots without actually using a long rest. To do so, we're all going to go back to the camp, and I'm going to go speak to Gale. And I'm going to tell him, I need you to stay in the camp for a little while. Let's separate for a moment. So remember, we haven't actually long rested, so Gale should still have the same spell slots expended. Let's now give him a little hit. What I'll do is I'll just take off my weapon, so I'm not going to do much damage to him, and I'll just give him a little friendly punch. It's a friendly punch, not a big deal. So he's going to heal himself, because he doesn't like that, using the spell Regain Hit points is an ability that I believe isn't actually usable by anyone other than NPCs that aren't in combat to sort of put them back to neutral. It was only a little punch. He's not that mad at me. But now what I'll do is I'll say, hey, Gail, let's uh, let's keep going. Why, why are you not in the party? And at this point, because he used that restore his own health effect, what should happen is all of those spell slots that he used should be back. Okay, interesting. It's restored his spell slots. One, two, three, four, and five are all back, of which I used multiple, but for some reason it didn't bring back level six. As you can see, these all recharge per long rest, so there's no other way that he restored these other than that little heal we just watched. For some reason it hasn't restored level six, but it has restored everything else. If you guys know how or why this is happening, let me know. But I'm going to assume that it just restores spells other than the max level. In any case, this is a very useful tip to restore spells without actually having to long rest. You can just go to camp, tell Gale to leave for a second, give him a quick punch, he'll heal himself and restore his spell slots, which is undeniably very useful. So thank you to the user who commented that. I wish I could credit you better, but at least it's on screen. This next tip is to do with concentration spells you're using during a fight, usually ones that last a certain amount of turns, like Cloud of Daggers here, that last 10 turns. It's a minor thing, and it's something that I've kind of known while playing, but to be honest with you, I've had a hard time remembering where the hell it is because the icon is so small. I do think this will be more commonly known, though, so I'm just going to highlight it very quickly. We have a concentration spell, like Cloud of Daggers. I put it on the ground, now it's in a fight. The fight has progressed, and now this Cloud of Daggers is a problem. I don't want to walk into it. I don't want to take damage. There's no reason for it to be there. The fight is done, and it's still going. You can cancel these spells and concentration effects like this by going to the person that's cast it on their icon, and just below it is the actual active spell, which, as you can see, has an X next to it, which we can press, that cancels the concentration effect. Again, this is something that I've known since early access, but in the time between, I just forgot where it was. And even though I knew that you could do that, I couldn't find it. And I kept looking on the left here like, oh, it must be here with the buffs. But where is it? I don't get it. I was confused. I feel silly even saying this, but maybe I'll help someone. So I'm just acknowledging it in this video. So for our final thing today, I'm back to terrorize this poor guard once again. Something I've been doing in my own gameplay that I've realized I should probably mention in this series is when I'm about to take on a massive challenge, like an end game boss fight, of which there are some seriously tough ones in Act 3, what I've been doing is I've been pre-casting. If you didn't know, pre-buffing spells is well worth doing before an immediate fight. One obviously you, you know is coming. But there's an issue with pre-buffing and pre-casting that basically prevents people from doing it. Take Bless here. For 10 10 turns total, I can bless up to three creatures to improve their attack rolls. So let's buff up. Cool, we're all blessed and we're stronger and we're dealing more damage for 10 turns before the fight. But the problem is, 
the buff is currently running out right now. Instead of having 10 turns, we're at 9. In fact, now we're down to 8, and it's just going down and down and down. So, before you actually fight and buff up before the fight, you need to do it quick, right? Before this 10 turns runs out. The problem with that is, say I'm planning on buffing people before the fight happens, and then I'm also going to maybe give my main ally who's going to do the most damage haste. Okay, now we're ready to fight. Let's begin the fight. I'm going to have 9 turns of haste, 4 turns of bless as we begin the fight, instead of 10 and 10, which is obviously a lot better. Well, what you can do is just use turn-based mode, of course. So let's bless up again to get it back to 10 stacks before we start the fight. And there we are, all at 10 stacks of bless. And this time, it's not going down. Let's swap to Gale and again haste the main person that's going to do most of the damage. Great, now he's got 10 stacks of haste and that's going to last as long as possible throughout the fight. With us double buffed up and ready to go, we can start the fight immediately and as you can see, I've got 9 stacks of bless and haste at the start of the fight, lasting 9 more turns ready to go. So I should be ready to absolutely destroy this poor guard who has truly done nothing wrong at all except just be a convenient dummy that I can hit right next to a waypoint. So yeah, this is something that I just do in my own gameplay. I go into the big tough fights as fully prepared as I can, making use of this trick. Technically, you can use one character to do multiple buffs, but in that case, you'd need to be out of turn-based mode, apply the first buff, then go turn-based mode and apply the next one, and then you can do multiple like that. But knowing this can really improve the start of a fight, and you know, the start of a fight often decides how it's going to go in the first place. So make use of this if you've not been. But there you have it, another round of useful, interesting things that you probably didn't know in Baldur's Gate as always, I hope this was useful to you, or very least interesting. Hopefully there's at least a few things you didn't know. On that note, as always, if you do have anything you think most people don't know, you've noticed or seen somewhere or whatever, then let me know in the comments. Maybe we'll include it in a future video. For now though, I've been Hollow, you've been you, thank you for watching, we'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye